Oh God, what more can be said about this amazing story? But maybe, maybe, put power in these humble words and open up our tired hearts so that you might sneak in once again, all in the name of Christ. Amen. So it was the day after church, or a big day after Christmas, and it had been a long night, sort of like this, lots of Christmas Eve services. The pastor decided to come back to the church the next morning to kind of clean up, pick up those last remaining things that they'd all been too tired to do the night before as, as the last service let out. And as he was in the church sanctuary, picking up some stray bulletins and some Kleenex that were in the pews, he looked out the window and he noticed the nativity scene outside, the beautiful new nativity scene that had just been purchased by a very important donor in the church, was missing the baby Jesus. So he walked outside to investigate just a bit. He looked around, he looked back underneath the manger, he looked behind the stable, he looked everywhere, and no baby Jesus. He was getting panicked now because he had been planning to come back to this donor the last week of the year to see if there might be one more gift to help them make it to the very end of the, the season. And now what was he going to tell them? Baby Jesus was missing. And then out of the corner of his eye, he sees a little boy, one of the kids who lived in the neighborhood, his name was Andrew. And Andrew's got a wagon. In the wagon is baby Jesus. He's pulling him around the block. And he lets out this big sigh and he goes over to the little boy and he says, Andrew, it's so good to see you and to see baby Jesus in your wagon. Can you tell me what's going on here? And Andrew says, well, pastor, I prayed to the baby Jesus that I'd get a wagon for Christmas. And if I did, I told him I would give him a ride. <laughs> so I'm just giving baby Jesus a ride. That's a good ending, isn't it? It's amazing how many of us are here tonight to see if we're willing to give Jesus a ride again. Maybe for the first time in our lives, to see if we can trust this child who promises so much. We've heard about him for so long. Or maybe our faith is in need of a spark. We need to hear this story in a fresh way. We need to try to give Jesus a ride again. Maybe we used to, and maybe we haven't been running close. And so we show up on Christmas Eve just hoping, praying that this be the year that something breaks through. It's amazing how the children get it, isn't it? How little Andrew knew that Jesus was that close to him and he could just go for a ride in his wagon. I've been amazed and I've been in, uh, astonished at all of the ways I've seen Jesus come alive in so many nativity scenes and plays over the last month. This was the scene from our Some Music and Some Mores back at the beginning of December. We do an impromptu nativity. Anybody can have a part. Anybody can get up on stage. It's a simple thing and a joyful thing, and we have so much fun. And then this week, I was at our granddaughter's uh, preschool pageant, and they had their own version of the nativity. I love their backdrop, by the way. I'd like to borrow that sometime. But those... Angels were equally, equally joyful and the shepherds equally astonished. And then at our 4 o'clock service today, our family service, we had our own pageant this year with our own angels. We had almost 500 people at that service. It was packed to the gills, full of life and joy. We had a very proud shepherd. We had a humble Mary and Joseph and a complete cast of characters who in the end bring that story to life in ways that not much else can. Our children have never lost touch with this Jesus who they want to give a ride to in the wagon, and some of us need to get, regain that touch. They invite us into this story, which we know so well, but I just want to make a couple comments about this familiar story. It's a story where there's a decree and there's also a counter-decree. From the beginning of his gospel, 
Luke has been telling us about a God who is up to new things, a God who has taken root and taken a hold of a life in Mary and wants to use her to change the world. And if we were paying attention when Reverend Lee, Lee preached about that beautiful song, that beautiful revolutionary song that Mary sings, it sings of a world that is being turned upside down by the love of God where the rich are going to go empty away and the poor are going to be filled, where no one will hunger any longer, where the world will be made right once again. And it's into this setting now that we come in chapter 2 and see the contrast drawn out as well. You see, there's a first decree that goes out, an official announcement, and it goes out from the people in power. It says, when Caesar Augustus went out, it said, all the world should be registered. And what the people in power wanted to do was to make sure they knew who you were so they could tax you, so they could big, build bigger palaces, so that they could accumulate more wealth for the kingdom and the monarchs, they didn't care what your name was, but they did care where your money was. It was when all of these bigwigs were there, Quirinius and Herod, and it may sometimes sound familiar to us 2,000 years later when we wonder, do we matter ourselves? So there is this official decree that goes out to all the world from the powerful people, the power brokers. And then... Just verses later, there's another decree. And the decree this time is on the voice of angels. And the decree this time comes to simple shepherds who are out in their fields watching their flocks by night. And this decree says that the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Now lest we think that these shepherds uh, were lovely people, just having a nice stroll. I, I found this wonderful quote this week. It says, only suburban and city folk confuse lambs and shepherds with fluffy, gentle little things and those who tend them as kindly nature enthusiasts enjoying an evening under the stars. We sometimes romanticize them that way, but the shepherds had a hard life. They were out there in the cold. They were out there in the weather. They had to protect their sheep at all costs. And they were not at the upper echelons. They were at the lowest rung of the ladder. It was the grunt work that no one else wanted. And sometimes these people just had to do because no one else would do. And it's to these folks that the angels appear with a second decree. The angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. All the people. And the fact that the angels come to the shepherds, the lowest of the low, not the highest of the high, the, the fact that they show up in Bethlehem, an out-of-the-way no place, and not Jerusalem, the fact that they show up to, these, to this working class of people and not in the palaces with the kings, gives them all the more credibility to say when they are saying all the people, they mean all the people. That there is good news that God's love extends to all the people. And God means all the people, even those who have been rejected and cast aside and cast down and told they're not worth anything. And you know, I think I could take a Jesus for a ride who looks and talks and acts like that. This kind of God is a God that I could get behind. A God that I could try to follow. You may have heard or read or seen on the news that they've canceled Christmas in Bethlehem this year. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because if any place is the epicenter of the celebration of the birth of Christ, it's Bethlehem. And for those of us who have been there, it is a sacred place. Even if the places might be just a little bit approximate where everything happened, for sure. But it's amazing to go to the church nativity and to be in that place that marks that moment, but their services will be silent this year. They'll be quiet, the priests will be there, but not all the people. They've encouraged the people to stay home this year. And out on 
manger square and out in the streets of Bethlehem, there have been no Santa parades, there were no lights, there were no uh, joyful celebrations, there were no tourists that make this all possible. All the people that flock because of the war that's going on in the Holy Land right now. And the Palestinian Christians in the West Bank have chosen to stand in solidarity with the Palestinians in Gaza. And they said, how can we be celebrating our Christmas and pretend that things are just like normal? And how could we just go on like that? But we will stand in solidarity. The Lutheran pastor there put out a different kind of nativity this year that features Jesus and all of the holy family and the shepherds and the wise men in the midst of the rubble. And this version of, of the nativity is both a political and a theological statement because it says that this God who comes to love the world, that this Jesus who comes to take up residence among us, that this Jesus will not be thwarted even by war and violence. Jesus will show up, whether our circumstances are wonderful, Jesus will show up in the hardest of places, and especially there, among the poor and the fleeing, the refugee and the scared. And I don't know about you, but I could ride with that kind of Jesus in my wagon. The Gospel of John talks about a God who takes up residence in the neighborhood. And not just residence in the neighborhood, residence in any and every neighborhood. Residence wherever we find ourselves, wherever God's people are, God will not stand apart. God will never be afraid to show up, even in the hardest places even in the places that seem most hopeless, especially in those places. We say his name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. John puts it poetically, the word became flesh and lived among us. And in this simple scene that Luke paints for us about Jesus coming among the poor and the humble and a cast of characters you could never believe would be assembled. Jesus makes a home among us. Grace upon grace. Truth comes through Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes God known. I can follow a Jesus like that. I want to take that kind of Jesus for a ride. And finally, I wanted to say that love came down at Christmas, not up. We don't go up to God, but God comes down to us. And that's good news. The heavens cannot hang on the wild, risk-taking generosity of God who has literally fallen to earth, Janet Marley, Morley says, to be with his beloved people. That the heavens cannot contain this God whose desire is to come to us, to be with us, to be Emmanuel. Holly and I were blessed to take a trip to Greece, and no, she did not ride that motorcycle, though I did stage the picture to make it look like she had. <laughs> we went with some good friends, and we got to see all kinds of iconic sights there. It was a beautiful thing. We saw the windmills in Mykonos, and the beautiful blue domes in Santorini, icons that are exquisite and draw you deeper into faith. Night scenes that were stunning, day scenes of these ancient churches, these ancient signs of faith, and ancient ruins that have been rebuilt. We were with, there traveling with two of Holly's college classmates and their husbands as well. And it was Laura on the left in this picture who had put an extra place on our itinerary, one I had never heard of and one I would never have chosen, but I'm so glad that she did. It's called Meteora. It's a series of monasteries that are at the top of these peaks. And these, at, its, at, at its height, uh, there were 24 of these monasteries. Up on the top of these mountains, you can see the clouds because you're way up in the sky. They, they seem suspended between heaven and earth. 
They started, some hermits started hanging out there in the 8th and 9th centuries. They started building monasteries in the 12th century. By the 14th century, there are 24 of these monasteries there. And you used to have to climb these rope ladders. You see the ladder that there is kind of a recreation of the old ladders you used to have climbed. Or you were, uh, today they've got cable cars that help to carry up people and provisions. But you used to also have to go up these nets and be hoisted up by, and occasionally the nets broke. And occasionally, you didn't make it. It took great courage. It tra- took amazing faith to build these places, to live in these places. And they were trying to preserve the faith as best they knew it. It was a stunning and a beautiful place to be. But as I found myself there and thinking about Christmas and looking back now, is I don't think that's the Christmas story because here they had chosen to cloister themselves off away from the world and at Christmas we have a story about a God who comes right in the midst of the world. A God who will not separate himself from us. A God who is right in the middle of all things, good and bad. And it's not that we have to climb up to the highest peak to get closer to heaven, but no, it is a God who comes down to earth to be with us. And a Jesus like that, I could take that Jesus for a ride. We just said goodbye to a wonderful woman, Rosalind Carter. And you probably followed the news about her passing and also her incredible life and the testimonies that came out. It's a beautiful service at the National Cathedral. All of the former living first ladies were there in their elegance and in their uh, in their respect for this amazing predecessor. And when I think about Melania and Michelle and the the way they carried themselves with elegance, and then if you think about the picture you have in your your mind about Rosalind Carter, it's not in that fancy first lady dress, even though she does have a portrait like that in the White House. People who were remembering her were remembering her on the work site with Jimmy Carter, her husband, Not for the photo op, but because they just believed that as a follower of this son of a carpenter, that you served other people, that you cared for the poor, that you gave yourself over in love to others. And so, so many people talked about remembering her in a tool belt and not a formal gown. I want to be remembered that way, as a servant who loved other people and not maybe somebody who stood apart because of position or power. Sounds like the God who came down to us and Jesus because she gave her life over to this one who had given his life for her. I could take that Jesus for a ride. The song that I've been singing and listening to over and over is a song about love coming down this season. It's called The Earth Stood Still by the Future of Forestry and says, The hope of the world and a baby boy, I remember him well like I was there that night. My heart was there and I felt the chill. Love came down and the earth stood still. Love came down and the earth stood still. Friends, this is the night that we celebrate that love came down and the earth stands still. I don't know about you, but I could take that kind of Jesus for a ride. And maybe you could too. But I've got an even better suggestion. How about you let Jesus take you for a ride? It'll be the ride of your life. Amen.